We've been doing this series on the truth about. And so really the truth about many things. First of all, there's a whole series uh, that we've done Sunday since the Lord laid this series on me. And that we've covered all kinds of things. The truth about the coming of the Lord. The difference between the rapture and the second coming. We've talked about the truth of, about prayer and how it works effectively. We talked about the lies of the enemy and how this is the end time and what we are to do as Christians in this time. You see, we're at the greatest time that could ever be. And you say, well, pastor, why would you say that? Because you were born at this time. You were born with a reason and a purpose, and God had caused you to be born at this time. So we need to embrace that, and we need to thank God. And you say, well, if I would only was born back in the day when I was with Jesus. Oh, no, you don't want to be back there. How about way back in the beginning? No, no. And so we're going to talk about one of the subject matters that I think a lot of Christians today misunderstand. I have noticed through the years, and maybe you have too, that a lot of times I will ask Christians to open up in prayer and, and or maybe pray over the meal. And you'll hear from them, oh, I, I don't feel adequate enough to pray. And, and you know, oh, would you, would you lead us in a time of prayer for this person? Oh, would you have somebody else do that? And I'm convinced as a pastor that people have a surface relationship with God, but don't realize how much the Father loves them. So our teaching today is the truth about the Father's love. And because people sometimes feel on the spot and they feel inadequate, I want to let you know, it's only because you've not got exposed to God enough where you feel comfortable and settled in, where you can talk to God about everything, anything. Hello? He's your heavenly father. We taught uh, many things about him, you know? So I want to say good morning to you. Amen. What a time to be alive. Are you glad you're alive? Amen. You could have woke up in heaven. Of course, that would have been better. Amen. So it being at this time, a lot of people have been subject to something that's beyond their control, but not beyond God's control. We're talking about this virus thing. During this time, though, let me ask you, how's your, tel how's your fellowship with God? Let me encourage you to, to really build that fellowship up and don't go by what you see or hear out there in the world because there's something operating deeper and stronger than ever before. It's like a current of the spirit of God that's moving. And we know that mystery is God has been moving. And we know that if our life is wrapped around him, then we become stable and our life is held together. But when our life is only in a matter as a Christian that we visit God when we're in trouble, you're going to find that your life's going to be full of problems, even if you are a Christian. Because there's two of us, we've discovered. There's the carnal us, and there's the spiritual us. Which one are we? We are the one that we get up in and pay attention to during the day. So either we can pay attention to ourselves and what we're doing during the day, or we can pay attention to what God is doing in us for the day. Amen. See the difference? Someone say amen out there. So welcome to this morning's briefing. There's an awakening happening to the body of Christ. Those that are watching and alert for his coming are finding their eyes becoming enlightened and God is beginning to open them up for what is going to happen. Many believers are understanding who they really are and in that understanding, we literally learn and encourage to walk with God. Amen. Now, if you think about it, Adam, God came down because he loved him so much and walked with Adam and Eve. In other words, Adam had a face-to-face -face relationship, a deep relationship. He knew about the love of God. 
But we know what happened. The enemy came in, sold him a different bag of words and narrative, and told him some lies. And then Eve gave eight of the fruit. She gave to her a husband. And they both fell. Now, after they had fallen, you need to understand that Adam's perspective and view of God was changed. He no longer seen God as somebody that came to visit him and that loved him and created him. But now he saw God through fear. He's got, he saw God through trouble. We see in the beginning there that he hid himself. We find out that, that when God says, have you eaten of the tree? And he says, it was the woman you gave me, God. So not only did he blame the woman, but he blamed the father. And I want to tell you, many, many Christians today need to stop blaming God because everything that is not perfect or righteous is not of God, has a mixture of man and the enemy in it. And let me bring you up to speed. This world right now is, is not fully redeemed. There is an evil outlaw in this world. His job is to deceive you and to convince you you don't need God. God is just a crutch. Well, did you know because of a lack of knowledge, many Christians have a blockage when it comes to relating to God, having a deeper time in prayer and having a deeper relationship? You see, when I was raised, we were taught to pray until you couldn't see or stand up any longer. Why would you do that, Pastor Kerry? Because we wanted to get face to face with God. We wanted to hear from God. We were tired of hearing from religion, tired of hearing what man's opinion said, tired of hearing that this world's going to hell. Yes, go ahead. And we would seek God and we would pray. And at that time, I didn't have a full-time job, so I had the time to devote into that time of seeking God. And it was those times of getting used to God and seeking God that he created the changes in me. You see, you get the change in your spirit first, then you get it in your soul and it works itself out into your life. Yes. Now, the exciting thing about it is, is what I have to share with you today, if you're a timid Christian, will give you boldness, will cause you to realize how much God loved you. How much that love is still instilled and still operating in the earth today. That love is wrapped up in total goodness. And we overcome evil with good. We overcome hate with love. Now someone said, well, Jesus said, if your enemy curses you, bless him. He says, if he slaps you on one cheek... Turn to him the next. What are we going to do about that, Pastor Kerry? You see, that's Old Testament. Eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus was saying, instead of operating in Old Testament and giving everybody what their due deserve was, we operate in the New Testament. And if you will offer Jesus' cheek, to the one who slapped your carnal cheek, then you step up in Jesus, I guarantee they won't be able to even lift their hand because they'll be striking God and not you. But we have to begin to think what God set us up with, how much God really loved us, how much he really put us in a position in him, and how much it is of our importance to learn to walk in love. I know that when I first started teaching on God's divine love, that people say, oh, I know all about love. Yeah, this love stuff. Love is the very issue that God gave salvation to us. Can you say amen? So let me give you four quick definitions of the word love. The last one I'm going to give you is a word that was not invented until Jesus did his earthly ministry. They had no word to describe the love of the Father in Jesus. So they had to bring a new word into the operation, a new born-again word, agape love. Now, they had to have a word about love to describe Jesus' love of the Father. So let me up. First love we have, we're pretty used to it, is friendship love. We have the word phileo, 
friendship love. We have the, what is it? The city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, right? And then there is Eros. Eros is a husband and wife intimate love exchange. Okay? There's another word. It's called storge. Everyone say storge. Storge is a simple word which means that love will develop over a period of time, whether it be a partnership, whether it be a marriage, whether it be a friendship. David and Jonathan were good friends. Okay? And that developed over a period of time. So storge love develops, love grows in storge. So we have three, but the last one, they had no description. They needed some kind of word that would describe a love that's never ending, that is not conditional, that it has no merit to earn it. Why? Because Jesus was the embodiment of the Father's love. And he had an assignment to do and to follow through in. And so they came up with the word agape, which means God's unconditional, unstoppable love. Now, I had a guy one time say to me, well, God doesn't, God doesn't give unconditional love because he says, if you keep my commandments, then my father will love you. What are you going to do about that? Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament, they had to prove that they loved God by works. In the New Testament, we prove we love God through faith. Can you say amen? So the people that wanted to prove that they loved God in the Old Testament often failed, didn't they? Right? All they needed to do was say, God, I can't do it. And God says, oh, good. Have faith in me and I'll do it for you. Are you with me? Allow the scripture now to give us a new insight if you don't already have an insight that's good about the Father. Let this be a reminder of how much God loves you and the power of that love and the power of God's care towards humanity. You know, God's not sitting up there with a big stick. Amen? Amen? Ready to whack you when you get out of line. And you got all these Old Testament people. Oh, God, God's bringing judgment to America. I would say that the devil's bringing confusion. But God isn't bringing that. Let me ask you, which of you can show me in Scripture where God punishes the righteous with the wicked? Never. And since when does God change? Isn't he the same yesterday, today, and forever? So when God deals with us just like we, we, we sang, he deals with us perfectly. He deals with us differently than in the Old Testament. Hello. Now, another question that's asked me a lot, that maybe you've thought about it too, is why do we see God seem to respond differently in the Old Testament Versus how he responds to us in the New Testament. Now, let me just give you a couple examples. When they mishandled the ark, what happened to them? They died. Why? Because there was a way to handle the presence of God in the Old Testament. Because there was no protection. So God had to put a veil in the temple to keep people from going in there and looking and dying. So there was something about God's holiness, something about God's presence that could kill a sinful human being. So God requires blood to cleanse us, to, to shut down the ooze of sin that comes out of us every day. That's why when we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, his blood continually is applied on our life daily. Why? So God can fellowship with us. So we, we do no longer need the blood of bulls and goats. 
We have the blood of Jesus Christ that allows us entrance with the Father without any offense. Even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, Christ made you alive. Can you say amen? And so you need to understand that God had to invent a different word for Jesus, a word that has no condition to it. How many here know you can't earn your salvation? It was a gift. How many here know you can't earn your healing? It's a gift. So how do you receive a gift? You humbly, but by faith. All right, you got it. Now go with me to John 14, please. We're going to open with this text. Look at verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Now listen to this next phrase. Very important that you understand this. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but... It says, no one comes to the Father except, now you might want to say, by me. That would work. But it doesn't say by. It says, through me. That means we pass through Christ when fellowshipping with the Father. Hello? In other words, we approach God in Jesus. Amen. When we walk in the day, we approach the day in Jesus. Yeah. When, when the enemy sees us, we approach him in Jesus, and he flees. But most of the time, we approach him in ourselves, and we threaten him by ourselves, and we stand there, and we go, I take authority over you to your horse and all you need to do is project Jesus out of you and whisper the name of Jesus and man it's done so you can see we need to understand that God has such a great love for us that we can settle in and begin to understand him the way he's supposed to be understood can you say amen amen so it says I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Now, here's the problem. The Israelites didn't know a loving father. Did you know that? They knew the father was mad at the world. There was an evil devil, and God had chosen them to bring forth the Messiah, and they were going to tell the world, straighten up. But they had no loving concept of God. They only had God. You better obey him. You better get right with him. You better hold on to the law or you're going to get in trouble. In other words, God to them was more harsh, more matter of fact. He punished at a quick whim. And everybody goes, man, that doesn't sound like the God that lives in my heart. It is, but listen, most people don't understand why God had to deal with so harshly in the Old Testament. I'm going to make it simple so you understand. Okay? For example, he told Joshua, you go into the promised land, you kill everybody. Then I tell you to get, wipe them out. The kids, the cattle, you get them all wiped out. And, oh my gosh. People read that and they go, oh, oh, oh what are we going to do? Listen, you never start reading your Bible in the New Testament from the Old Testament. You start in the New Testament getting to know Jesus first. Why? You see, in the Old Testament, there was a problem. And the problem was God the Father had to get his son to be born in the earth. Legally come and be born of a woman yet not born having sex, but born by the Holy Spirit so his blood is not tainted, so he could take his blood and take it to the cross and shed it for the remission of our sins. Perfect in all his ways. Yet he was open because he was a human to all the temptations and all the junks you and I 
go through. He says he was touched with all the fillings of our infirmities, yet without sin. So Jesus was love embodied, personified to come fulfill the will of the Father so God can win his family back. Now the way God has it set up is anybody that will call on the Lord shall be saved. But Satan is working hard to paint a wrong picture of God. So people say, well, it's God's bringing this COVID thing. God doesn't use COVID. He can get good out of it, but he doesn't bring it. The Bible says every perfect gift. COVID's not perfect. Flu is not perfect. Things that go wrong with our body is not perfect, so he's not bringing that. So we can relax in God's presence and know that whatever we ask, if we ask amiss, we ask wrongly, he's not going to punish us. The ground's not going to open up and swallow us. You get a chance for fun. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is relating how tough it was in the Old Testament for the Israelite believers. If they murmured and complained, it says the serpents came in the camp and bit them. The, the guy that God says, look, when you go in and you conquer Jericho, don't take anything from Jericho. This is my first fruits. All the things that Jericho belong to me, don't touch any of it. Don't claim any of it. And we know that Achan took some clothes, took some jewelry, hid it under his tent, and his whole family was killed because of it. And you go, what? I, look at the harshness. Look at all that. And that's where people hang out. They hang out in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was designed for one thing. And that was to bring the Messiah through the bloodline so that one day we could accept him and he would be born as a human being. He would go and take our sin and our sickness and he would go to Calvary's cross and he would shed his blood for the remission of everyone. And as many of us are wise enough to call upon him, we get that benefit. Can you say amen? So the Old Testament, God was protecting the birth of Messiah. So anybody, whether they were a Jewish person or a Gentile person, anyone that came against the plan of Jesus being born in the earth, God dealt with them as an enemy of all righteousness. But we found out Satan couldn't stop Jesus from being born. Well, we found out even when he was born, they went to kill him. So, I want to let you know, don't, don't you even think for a minute, you being filled with God, people aren't going to hate you for that. They're going to hate you because you're good. So you don't put your eyes on man, you see? Because man isn't going to make you happy or sad. Listen, dangerous place, and my wife will tell you this, to put your wife is on a pedestal. Dangerous place to put your husband is on a pedestal. You put Jesus there. You put Jesus in the middle of between you and your husband, you and your wife, and he will hold your marriage together. But you get to exalting any human being, any created being, created thing, and you will open a door for the enemy to harass you. So that's why I tell everybody, don't go out, search for a husband. Don't go out, search for a wife. God will bring one to you. If you're that, paying attention to him, he'll bring them to you. Well, it's kind of a small church for God bringing me. He will move heaven and earth for you. Remember, you have a covenant? Certainly the devil doesn't have one. All right, so let's check this out. And he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. He's about ready to reveal something. And from now on, you will know him and have seen him. And Philip, bless his heart, walking in the spirit. No, he was, he was as curious. As Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father that it will satisfy us. Right? Now, what did Jesus just get through saying? I'm showing you the father. And now on you see him, you will know him. And Jesus will clarify here in a minute. Watch this. And Jesus answered and said to him, 
Lord, show us the Father that is sufficient for us. And Excuse me, Philip said. And, and Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you had not known me, Philip? Many Christians today have been with the Lord a long time, but they have not taken the time to get to know they know that they know that they know they know God. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm saying they certainly are. But they're still trying to please God physically and not please God from their heart. Difference. Are you still with me? And he says, show us the Father. Do you have believe that I am in the Father? He says, Jesus said, do you believe, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, Jesus said, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the what? One of the things you need to realize is the Jewish people were totally into a works program. They believed that they could prove to God how wonderful they were by working hard. How many know that's a lie? God's already loved you and he's already accepted you. So you're not working to get something from God. You're working and competing against your flesh to follow God properly. You're not competing against another human being. You're competing against yourself and the devil from keeping you from obeying God. So let's continue on. Listen to this. Okay. He says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. And now you'll understand the next phrase, because they believed in works. This is why Jesus said this. He says, or else believe me for the very works themselves. You can tell God's in somebody, but the things they say and do. Now, the problem is many Christians aren't very deep with God. And so a lot of things come out of the side of their mouth with no discipline. And immediately the devil goes, hey, that's so-and-so. That's not Jesus in there doing that. So if you want to know how the devil can pick up on when to attack you, your words tip him off. Your countenance, a big sludgy face. Please don't let the devil see that you're unhappy. Hide it from him. Hide it from him, I said. Because all he can see is the surface of you. But the real goods inside of you are in your heart. So when somebody says your face reflects your thought, especially in church, just we'll pass on pine All right. A couple of points I want to make. Believe me for the very works themselves. A couple of points. I have quickly five points to give you. Ever since Adam fell, Adam began to see God in a different way that he ever saw him before. Remember, Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. Now he was seeing God in a different light. Second of all, Adam was now bound by fear and shame. He saw God in his fallen state and hid and blamed and tried to justify himself with fig leaves. Thirdly, the Jewish nation saw God as all-powerful and almighty. Now remember, you know I'm not picking on Jewish people, okay? They saw him that way. God wanted to prove himself that way. Why? Because there's an evil, wicked person in the earth. So the Jewish people saw God that way. But God really wasn't all that way, was he? Okay? Jewish, okay? The Jewish nation, their tradition, saw God as a powerful almighty. What God said to them then was to be obeyed or else. Right? You got stoned to death for doing some pretty dumb things. Aren't you glad you're in the New Testament? <clears throat> Excuse me. Fourthly, we as believers must understand the vital importance of getting Jesus into this world so they may see who he really is. He has seen me, 
Jesus said, has seen the Father. We as the church need to reflect the Father so people can see that God is not the God only of the Old Testament, but he's the God who sent Jesus for a redemption of a family. And fifthly, the Jewish nation didn't understand Christ's mission. Their eyes were blinded because of the nature that was in them. They had a bad concept of who God was and had no reality of his love for his children. In fact, the way they treated Jesus. Here Jesus came to Israel and shared all the fulfillment of the scripture and they wanted to tear his head off. Kind of like the time we're living right now. People don't know why darkness is getting darker and light is getting lighter. Which side are you on? You can't straddle the fence. This is the time not to straddle fences right now. Listen, you said something, follow through. Right? You promise something, try not to promise. Okay? But if you do, follow through. Amen? Aren't you glad when God says, as many as call on my name, did God follow through? He did. Is God still with you? God's still working on you? Is God still preparing and still won the victory? Can you say amen? Last week we taught you how to fight God's way. How to walk God's way and realize his love for us. Now, you might say, I know all this, Pastor Kerry. Now, let's get God to open your eyes. Let's go to the next step. Go with me to Matthew 21, please. Do you remember the story of the man who hid his talent? I bring it up a lot. There was man, a man who get five talents, another was given two, and another was given one. Remember the one five made another five? You go to Matthew. I'm just talking before you get there. And we found that the one that was given one could have done the same thing, but instead he saw God differently than where God was. Now, what you don't understand, and you might need to understand, is that when Jesus is talking about two sons, and he's talking about the people that forget to do the thing like that, he's talking about the Israelites and how it applies to us if we just do the same thing. So you're going to hear some stories here where the Israelites are included, yet you would never know this if, unless somebody told you. So Matthew 21, listen to this. But what do you think? Matthew 21, verse 28, uh, excuse me, verse 28 through 31. And here he, Jesus asks the question, but what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. What were the Jews noted for? Works. What did Cain do instead of Abel? Abel presented faith according to God, and Cain presented his works. You got to understand, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. You know, grace. We're saved by grace through faith. Now, Catch this. He's beginning to show what religion will do. Religion will give you a wrong concept of God. So this man, he hid his, he thought God was mean. Sounds like Old Testament to me. He thought God reaped where he didn't sow. How many know that God can't do that? It goes against its very nature. But the people of the Old Testament thought that when God opened things up and swallowed people and did all those kind of things, that God was going to straighten you all out, had a wrong concept completely. Yeah. There were a whole bunch of outlaws in this earth that were harassing God's seed. And God's seed had to rise up in the middle of it, so God had to rescue us. Amen. Now that evil seed of Satan is still in the earth. 
But you and I don't have to be concerned. He was already defeated 2,000 years ago, and the victory that Jesus won said he'll give it to you, and you become more than a conqueror. You see, I work hard, make a check, give it to my wife. I conquered the weak, but she did more conquering because she didn't have to work at all. It was handed to her. Now, you do have to work and all that kind of, but with the grace, you see, Jesus did all the work and handed the victory to you. Now, we maintain that victory by a strong relationship with God, and we start out every morning that way so that we cut the enemy out almost completely and entirely by doing it God's way. Can you say amen? amen. So let's look at this again. The man had two sons. He came to the first and he said, son, go into my vineyard and work. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And the, the second answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? Of course, that's pretty obvious. Now, which son was the Jewish son, and which son was the Gentile son? Think about it. I don't want you to answer it. I just want you to think. Hello. That's why Jesus said to the Jewish nation, let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. In other words, mean what you say, say what you mean, otherwise the rest of it's just foolishness and comes from the devil. He says, comes from sin. That's what actually that scripture says. Now, a couple of points under this scripture. First, I want you to realize who might be the two sons, okay? Second of all, what son respected his father? Well, let's look at the two sons. One who walks carnally, okay, from the old man trying to live up to God. And the other one has God in his heart, and he just wants to serve the father. He does, maybe doesn't know what to do, but he has it in his heart that he wants to be with God. So which son is which? You see, the, the Christian who wants to serve God will often answer from his flesh first. And says, I don't want to do that. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. But then listens to his heart and decides he, he's going to obey his father. And the second one's religious bound who's always bragged and did all kinds of things, and I'm not referring to any of you, please, and said, oh, yeah, you can count on me, and didn't follow through with his heart because he honored God with his lips, but his heart was far from him. So now you know the answer to that. Everyone say, got it, Pastor. Second, the heart motive of a believer is what causes us to keep going for God. Can you say amen? There's something in our heart, God, that's keep on saying, keep going, this is not it. This life here is really only a counterfeit. You're living a counterfeit right now. And yet you get good things and there are not so good things. But guess what? You're really not living outwardly, but you're living inwardly. For the God of Almighty God himself dwells in you. Yeah. Happy shall you be. Hello. But we don't focus on that. A lot of times churches don't preach those messages. We're supposed to preach the gospel. Not, you better be good so God can bless you. I know that you've been sleeping. I know that you've been good. Whether you're good or bad, or whatever, I don't even know how it goes. So be good for good. There. You guys can laugh. They're watching by YouTube. I can't believe he's doing well, I didn't come to be professional perfectly. I come to share you the message that hardly anyone is sharing nowadays. And that message is, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you've got it made if your focus is right. All right, let's go on. Thirdly, now God lives in you and I. And when we listen to him, and do what he says for us to do. The Bible says in James, we're blessed in everything we do. If you're doing what God asks you to do, and you're studying what the result there is, 
Satan can't fight against you because you're not doing your thing. You're doing God's thing. And the Bible says, listen to this scripture. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Didn't say whosoever. It says whatever. You got a vision from God. God truly gave it to you. It's an overcoming vision. God told you you're going to be doing this in your life. You better pay attention to God because he'll bring it to pass. The fact is that maybe you're not where God promised you you would be is not the fact that God's not getting you there. It's the fact that we need to pay a little more attention. Can you say amen? All right. Fourthly, Christians' flesh doesn't want to obey God. Just doesn't want to. You get up in the morning, your body's aching, your head throbbing, and God says, get up, let's go to church. And you go, now who's in control? Moving right past that. Hello? Christians... Flesh doesn't want to obey God. But God in our heart does the work. It's constantly bringing us to a place of fellowship with God. Listen to your heart. All right, go with me to John, please. Chapter 3. Remember the story of Nicodemus? John chapter 3, verse 15 through 18. Now, there's some really powerful words in here of Jesus. I want you to pay close attention to what, how he says it. Okay, verse 15, John 3. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, come to an untimely death or a tragic death, but have eternal life. How many here believe in him? Say, I have eternal life. How were the people in the Old Testament saved? They believed in him, and it was put on their account for righteousness. The people that did their own thing in the Old Testament usually got swallowed up by one way or another because the main fact was to get Messiah to be born in the earth so God could save the whole group of people instead of the one. And so let's go on past that and listen. For God so loved the world, you know the verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, very important here. For God did not send his son into the world like the Old Testament, judging and crunching and smashing and doing all those things a Messiah could be born. God did not send his son into the earth, into the world, to condemn the world. So Christians that condemn other Christians, you're in error. Christians that judge other Christians, you're in error. God did not come to judge you. He did not come to condemn you. He came to save you. Now, folks, I'm not completely, I'm going to say something, in my physical Body, I'm not completely saved yet. It's not till the trumpet sounds and this body's changed that I get the whole package. But I get the package by faith. You see, I got saved by getting born again. And my mind is being renewed, so I'm being saved by getting my mind into the Word of God and find out what God has for me. And then one day when that trumpet sounds and the milk shall spill... <laughs> The trumpet sounds, I bumped it with my elbow, and our body will be changed and we'll be fully redeemed. Yes. Now, are you going to let the devil talk you out of that? No. Well, then, let's get together. Let's fight for the knowledge of sharing to the world. Amen. Jesus is the ultimate answer. Amen. But we have to present him right. The church... I'm going to just say generally he's not presenting Christ the way he's supposed to be presented. Now, I'm not picking on all the church. He needs to be presented as the only answer, not religion. Jesus is the only answer. How is your relationship with him? We can tell by looking at you. So if you don't want to be seen as someone that is needing Jesus, of course, you want to be seen as someone needing Jesus, then realize that without him, we're all boobered. 
Somebody said, well, there's a lot of hurting and, and people that have error and they have flaws. You know, how's God going to heal all, all of us have flaws? The flaws are in our flesh. Hello? And God's already got that counted for. So that's why we don't look at the flaws of others. We all have them. Some of them hide them better than others. Let's move on past this. Now, let's get to what I'm trying to tell us. It goes on. For God did not send his son in to condemn the world. And verse 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. Say amen. amen. Put this with Romans 8, 1 in the, New, in the King James. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. amen. Look it. He believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. When God says, I so love the world that I gave my only begotten Son, now you know there's no limit to God's love. It doesn't shut off when you're being a bad girl or a bad boy. That love is still shoveling to you anything that you can receive. And God is just hoping that you won't let your flesh or the lies of the enemy shut you down from receiving, but rather you are one of those sponges that are grabbing your hand on everything you can get your hands on with God. Can you say amen? Yes, amen. A couple of points I want to give you. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Question, begotten son? I thought Jesus always was. Where'd the begotten come from? When he was born in the earth. All right, let's get it beyond all that weird stuff, okay? Begotten of a woman in the earth. Now, that was really hard to have God Almighty strip himself of everything and come and be born. And here's the God that's holding everything together in a little embryo in his mother's womb. Then he's born, he's a little infant, you know, holding the world together. What a miracle. And you and I want to be religious. Everyone say no. no. Amen. You can always tell the religious bunch, they know it all. All right, so God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Now you know where the begotten came from. Two, remember, there was a time, now listen, there was a time when, on the earth when there was only eight believers. I want to tell you, the devil is alive in this planet. And I want to, just a couple of things. We see that in, in Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man. Okay? And a lot of time passed from the fall of man. You go to Genesis chapter 5, and you see all the names of the righteous men of God. If you read those names, it will tell you that the Son of God will come and suffer and redeem mankind, and you will be saved. Those names all describe the message of salvation. In chapter 6, we begin to see a man starts to crawl and call out for God again. Satan has worked hard. And then we go up to 7 and to 8, and we see the building of the ark and the wording of the, of the deluge coming, and we see that only eight righteous survived. And that's still a question. Because the, the boys, Noah's sons, had to marry the world. So they had to have the wife God picked. There's another little lesson for us. Amen. So we know that the world was so corrupted that it was only eight believers, and God had to put them in a boat to protect them. So what makes you think that you can walk around as a human Christian in the flesh and not require a boat? <laughs> Come on. We can't. So let's just surrender and let God live in us. All right, moving right along. I, this, this reality, oh, it sounds so silly and so simple, but it's profound. You and I have an inheritance. Somebody died, rose again, and now sits at the right hand of the Father and acts like a lawyer, seeing that we get everything God promised that we would get if 
we keep our focus on God and we don't let the enemy try to steal it from us. Someone say amen. Must be the red shirt. Anyway, so let's go on to the next point. The Old Testament uh, people understood that God was horrific. He was almighty, right? The, the people in the promised land, people in Jericho, they had heard for years that the Israelites' God was so powerful, don't ever get in the way. And here comes these millions of people. They're all marching in order. Why, I love this. Waving the flag. <laughs> we're, we're, we're falling apart up here. Okay. And they're leading. And these people are going, this is the group that we found that their God will just literally destroy. What are we going to do? Yeah. Folks. You have the God Almighty living inside of you. When you get up, why shouldn't you get up in confidence in God? Okay. Why shouldn't we get up knowing we already got up in victory? Why should we be like Gehazi, you know, Isaiah's servant, and keep our eyes on the physical plane when Isaiah said, Gehazi, look up! Christians, look up! Yeah. Too much looking at things. All right. The Father's love. Remember the story? We call it in the Bible, the prodigal son. Remember? But it really isn't the prodigal son. It's a story about the loving father. And we're going to describe for you, because of time, the two sons. One son was not Jewish, didn't understand the coven, covenants of being religious or a Jew, which were good, by the way. And the other son was a Jewish follower. He was religious, and he had strong convictions. You got that? Then we have the father. Father's love's unconditional because he treats the boys the same. The father's love is perfect in every way because not only does the father see that his son is suffering, but he goes out to meet him. That's your God. He doesn't want you going through anything. You call on him, he'll go out to meet you. He'll rise up within you. He'll come down on you. And the devil... He's going to flee. But you got to know when you do, it happens. Do you know that you know that you know that you are this person that God went through hell and back to make you like this? Do you know that you know or are we being religious and playing the blah, 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 blah game? No, we can't do that. Not now. We could have done it 20 years ago. In fact, so many people did. That's why the revival stopped. 20 years ago because people got their eyes off the God who made the revival and put it on everybody being affected by the revival and so our eyes slipped off of God and back onto man you'll find trouble in your life comes when your eyes slip off of God back on to either yourself or man or the world I watch the news a lot because I have to be informed but I don't let the world tell me how to feel or how to think I let the Bible do that, and I can discern what they're saying through the Scripture and through the life of Christ. Jesus said, Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So Christians, line everything up in your life through the life of Christ. Line your Scriptures up through the life of Christ so you don't get religious teaching in there. If Jesus said it, Jesus did it. You know what's right. Hello? Okay, so Luke chapter, I love this. We're going to read rather quickly. It's uh, quite a bit. So Luke 15, 11 through 32. So let me read it to you. What I shared with you already, it will just come alive to you. Listen. 
Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me your portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now both sons got something, right? 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and journeyed into a far country. And there he, uh, he wasted his possessions with prodigal or fallen living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. And he began to be in want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Jesus said, look at the birds. None of them are, are starving during the depression. But see, what, what's happening is a lot of myriad of man's interpretations of things, yet the Father's love remains the same. So keep on with me, okay? And then he went out and joined himself to a citizen of the country. You know, sometimes we don't want to feel miserable by ourselves. We just want to have somebody feel miserable with us. So he joined himself with somebody of the country, right? Are you with me? Okay. Of the country. And he sent to him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the, uh, the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. That's what religion does. Religion says, get your act together. Don't bother me. John said it this way. How have you, with the love of God, have somebody come to your door and ask for a need and you send them away warm filled without doing anything to help them? He was reflecting on religious versus the grace of God. But verse 17 said, But when he had come to himself and said, How many of my father's hired servants have plenty enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and I'll go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. You ever said something like that? I'm not worthy to be your son. I've blown it for the last time. I'm just a, a no good Nick or whatever you use on your words. Hello? That's because you've been feeding on your own swine food. Stop it. It will reduce you down to nothing. And you guys are so filled with God. You're so loved by God. When a Christian is reduced to nothing, it gives the message that you're not obeying God or listening. And no matter what you say or do, it's going to testify of no relationship with God. So to change that, rather than falling under condemnation, you just say, God, I am sorry. And then you get on with the program. If you're going to stop and think about yourself, only do it for a moment and then move on. <laughs> Let's go past. All right, now, I love this. Then it goes on for this is, and then verse 20, okay, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father what? See, God's always looking towards us. He's always caring about us. In fact, if you read the book of Job, when Satan was going to accuse Job, God said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. God bragged on him. The only one who can brag is God. And yet we see that Job was doing a whole bunch of bozo things. Fearing, he wasn't just fearing, he was bound by fear, worried about his kids, married an unsaved wife who said, curse God and die. Well, I think he was pretty surrounded with some negatives, would you say? Thank God you don't have a husband or a wife that way. Let's go on. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe. You see, when we receive Jesus, your robe's taken off, and you are given the robe of righteousness. Amen. The best robe. 
when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because you came to the end of yourself eating swine food, the Father saw you afar off, and he ran to you. He runs to you. That's how he loves us. You never know it by looking at us sometimes. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe. Put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. That's a sign of being married to God. And sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. What does the Bible say? Over one soul that comes to the Lord, all the angels rejoice, all of heaven rejoices. Let us be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Oh, here comes the religious son. Actually, Jewish nation. Not all of them, just the religious attitude, okay? Again, I'm not picking on, but if you, you know, everybody says, well, how come you always seem to say that those Jews really, they got into trouble? Well, because God says they did. Because God says, clean up your act. Not me. Who am I to say that to another person? God's working on me. I'm under construction. But because they thought they were cool when they weren't cool, God had to show them all the time what bunch of goofballs they were. And he'll do the same thing with you and I when we get to thinking we're all that. And, you know, we do. We get to thinking after we've accomplished a few things and all, we get to sitting down and going, we got to be careful of that because after a couple of victories, Satan comes to steal. So you better be ready with a sword, ready to cut his head off when he does because you know he's coming. Just be ready in God. He says, look it. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now is found. And they begin to be merry. Now the older son in the field, as he came, drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, sounds like a Martha to me, and asked what was going on. Verse 27, and he said to him, your brother has come and, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I had to get some. So you got to see this. The Israelites, when Messiah came, they said, all these years we've been serving you. Jesus shows up and they crucify him. So you know you don't want to put your faith in a religion. Even the wonderful Jewish, wonderful Judea religions of the wonderful, wonderful nation of Israel. They were supposed to follow the promises of Abraham, but instead they preached the law. You see, when a Gentile came, they were supposed to hear about coming Messiah and how he was going to come forth from the nation of Israel. But instead they said, do this, do this, and you better get it together because you've got to line up, and if you don't, we're going to stone you to death. Boy, oh, happy day. You want me to join your church? And that's what they met the world with, was the law instead of grace, instead of promise. But you and I know better. Can you say amen? amen. But he was angry, verse 28, and would not go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered, and he said, Father, all these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment. Lie. <laughs> At any time, yet you... 
never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as his son, uh, as soon as your son of yours came, who had devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Folks, when a human being was born in the earth, we were not be supposed to be born death, dead. We were supposed to live forever. And because we were thrown into death, Romans chapter 5, Adam's sin gave us death. Okay, because we're thrown into death, the thing that we have and we feel that we have to do as humans is to work our way out of the mess we got ourselves in. And it doesn't work with God. God says, no, I'm going to rescue you instead. You just hold on to the life preserver. Stop fighting. Hold on and surrender. Let me pull you out of here. But you've got to obey me just so you don't get caught up on something on the way out. Say amen, somebody. <clears throat> Listen, and here's how the father feels for everybody. He says, and he said to him, son, you are always with me. How many Christians born in a religious family and maybe a second generation, mom and dad were saved, but you were saved through mom and dad's faith. You find out that you've got to learn about God on your own. You can't learn off of mom and dad. You get some ideas, but you've got to learn on your own. Here's the case. And he said, son, you've always been with me. And all I have is yours. Sounds like a second generation Christian, doesn't it? It was right and that we should make merry and be glad that he gave his life back. For your brother was dead and now is alive again. And that's the two. The first son was a human being, just a human being. The second son was a religious Jewish individual who were given the covenants. The religious Jewish individual should have been more compassionate, should have been more understanding, because his brother could have died out there in the field. But see, religion has no compassion. Religion only has judgments, condemnation, and always condemns you. You work really, really hard, and all you hear is, it's not good enough. <clears throat> Same thing will happen listening to my sermons. If you're listening to my sermons in the flesh, you will pick out only the thing that condemns you. And you will think that I'm preaching at you. That's called stupid gone to seed. Because it happens to everybody. You're not the only one. Didn't Elijah say, oh, come, I'm the only one that's suffering. And God says, hey, there's seven more thousand just like you. Why are you thinking about yourself? And so, finishing up the message. Say, I got it, Pastor Kerry. God so loved me that he moved heaven and earth to save me. And I'm going to value that. Are you going to va value your salvation? Or are you going to walk around like you haven't been saved? Now listen. Right believing creates right thinking. And right thinking and believing causes right actions which pleases God. Two, the two sons, the lost son and the religious son, you know the difference. Three, the father's love is unconditional. Always the same to everyone. Of course, the devil's not included. <laughs> and fourthly, Christians are coming home now. What are we meeting them with? Religion or with love? The father will kill a fatted calf, put a robe on, and a ring on his finger. But we as the church don't let the devil steal them the rest of the week. Some phone calls should probably be made. And then, finally, everyone say finally. First John, listen to what it says. 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God. Now, he uses the word agape. So you need to understand that. John does not talk about any other kind of word of love. Agape love is God's word. Can you say amen? And if you love through God's love, he's saying, then people know that you're saved. 
If you can't love others through God's love, but you're loving them through your love, which is conditional, you're my friend as long as you do what I want. I love those people. I want to be your friend, Pastor Kerry. I said, well, here's what you can expect. I will be your friend no matter what you do. Can you handle that? Wow, yeah. But you see, many times they don't consider you their friend that way. So remember, you're going to love people through the love of Christ, okay? But you're not going to love them in your own power. Because it will fall short and people will pick and choose. But if you love people unconditionally the way God loves them, they'll feel welcome, they'll feel open and want to respond to you. You want friends? You got to be friendly. Hello. Can't look like a grump and expect a bunch of people to come crowling around you. Come on. Now I am talking to you. All right. Don't look like a grump. All right. Let's move on past. Okay. So I just love this. Now listen. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knoweth God. He that loves not doesn't use agape love. You've got to realize that the word is a godly love. He doesn't operate from God's love, doesn't know God. Now, he's saying it's not saved. It's saying it operates as if they're ignorant about how God responds to a situation. Hello? God responds one way while you respond another way. We're limited while God is not. I remember one time driving up Eli Hill. That's a hill in Bonnie Lake. And God says, I'm going to use you mightily. And I said, oh, isn't that great? And then, boom, I was gone. I drove all the way up from the bottom of the hill, all the way to the top of the hill, and didn't even realize I was doing it because God was speaking to me. I came over the top of the hill, down the hill, and came up to 214th, and there was a man laying in the street with about 30 people around him. He had gotten hit. And I said, oh, gosh, and it was weird. This is how when you walk with God, and you can, you do. Just focus on it. God could use you at any given time, any given way. You're not more special than anyone else. You're just there where God needs you. So I came up over the hill, and there he was laying in the street. It was like God grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, pulled me out of the car. I walked right over there. I said, get out of the way, please. And I put my hand on. I said, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die, and you will come alive. I didn't even know if he was dead. Whatever it is, you're going to be healed. And the guy sat up with a smile on his face. I don't know what God, all he did with him. But I do know that crowd of 30 people were impressed. All they were doing is crying and weeping and saying, he's dead, call the ambulance. Clear out the unbelief and move right on in for God. Can you say amen? Well, how do things like that happen? They happen because you're spending time with the one you love the most. And the one that loves you the most says, here, let me show you something. And he shall show you things that come. Here, let me open your eyes to this. Will you trust me in this? Oh, Lord, what? I, I tell you, God led me and a friend one time over in Des Moines in my old neighborhood. I thought, man, you know, and he spoke to both of us audibly in the car with our, my wife and his girlfriend and says, I want you to stop here and I want you to pray over this property. So we stopped the car, got out and prayed over the property. And the power of God's wind picked up and just was like a whole wall of wind just went whoosh, whoosh. And a peace came in. God says, you're done. Two years later, Casey Treat built his church right on the property up from my house. Now, how many times will God use you when you're listening to him? You won't even know exactly what he's doing through you. How exciting that is. I can tell you until two weeks straight of all of the things God's done through me, even when I was ignorant. But the difference, I said, God, I didn't know the word very much at that time, and I didn't have any clue. He says, no, but you spent time with me, and that's what I require. Remember, I started this sermon off by, we spent hours, because we didn't know any different. Nobody told us we should be tired, and we just got around and fellowship with God. 
and God would do all kinds of crazy things. What happened to the church? God's killed a fatted cap. He put a row on you and a ring on your finger, and we're sitting around worried about COVID and worried about this and concerned about that. Now get up and share the good news. There's only a short time left. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord a praise? Yeah. Folks, I'm going to tell you. I know my, my wife was there and my dad and my elders. We were in the Road State, Rhodes Lake Victory Falls Community Club. It was packed wall to wall and God sent an angel. Well, what did it look like? Seven foot tall with wings? No, you're so religious. Not all angels have wings are packed. Only a few of them do. How do you know? Because I hang out with God. So anyway, what had happened is God was searching out those who were preaching the gospel. And this, I'm going to tell you, whether you believe this or not, this lady was 6'1". She, she had no purse. She had a Bible on her. And well, somebody's going to say, well, angels don't have any sex. Well, if they do, if God wants them to. God wants to hide them so you don't understand who they are to see how you're going to treat them. And he says, don't forget that some have run into angels unaware. Make sure you love everybody. Why? Because God's going to show you one day what you really need to work on. And so God sent this woman in. And I happened, it was only a one place in and one place out building. It was half the size of this and it was packed. We were having communion that day. This woman showed up late. She walked in. I saw no car. No other thing, she walked up, Bible in her hand, sat in the middle of the congregation. Were you with us at that time? No, I hadn't quite came yet. And so we went through our service. We went through um, communion. And I noticed she didn't take communion. Angels can't take communion. It's for the redeemed only. So they can't take communion. Because it's not for them. It's for us, you see. And she didn't take communion. I just, I just made a mental note. And, you know, I'm playing the drums. My mom's playing the piano. We're singing. We, we close. And then when we close, everybody got their eyes closed. And I'm giving the benediction. I open my eyes. And the one spot where she was sitting is empty. Nobody saw her leave. Nobody saw her go to the bathroom. A couple of my elders went searching for her. And God spoke up. And he said, I have sent an angel in the midst of you. There's going to be something on the horizon that's going to happen. Do not panic. Just continue to stay faithful. And we got visited. Now I'm going to tell you, it's going to start happening again now. Angels are going to start visiting and they're going to show up. Somebody comes here and you never, don't, don't know them. You don't recognize them. There's not a friend of anybody. Treat nice. Amen. Treat everybody nice. Even when people are being rude to you, be nice and just walk away. Hello. Because the time is coming and is now. It's starting to happen.